uh, perception. It's marketing, man. Meet Bill Nye. He is a science guy. This does not mean that he is a scientist, but that he loves science. So me and him, we are science guys. When I was little, I used to watch some of his programs, and like him, I got my inspiration from the late Carl Sagan. I learned that the scientific method is the best way to determine what is true and not, what is possible and what is impossible, and why we attach degrees of certainty to the possibilities. From these people, I also learned that taking things on face value is not good, and that you should always try to establish whether someone is trying to fool you. And that's where I have started to become slightly disappointed with Bill Nye. In the quest for more knowledge, I learned that I am a humanist. And this means that I want to live a life that means something to me and to others. I don't like the idea that we as a collective are doing things to each other and to our planet that causes needless suffering. So once you accept that you can't do something about this, further investigation is needed in order to find a way you can do the greatest good. One of these things is to explain to people how we cause climate change, how it harms nature and human beings, and how we can solve part of this problem. We should start with creating an abundance of energy, which in turn will probably lead to a decrease of suffering and an increase of prosperity. Has Bill Nye been misled? Or is he dishonest when he pontificates the idea that wind, solar, geothermal and some hydro can do it all? Which stems from a scientific study which in turn has spawned the Solutions Project. The Solutions Project has the outspoken support of Leonardo DiCaprio, Mark Ruffalo and Bill Nye. Uh, perception, it's marketing man. I haven't explained yet why this is such a big deal, but let's go on and establish whether Nye really means it. The same video provides the answer. Stand with Rand writes, can alternative energy effectively replace fossil fuels? Absolutely yes. Burning coal is the worst thing we can be doing. So I encourage you uh, to check out the solutionsproject.org. They have done an analysis of not only the United States' electricity needs, but 130 other countries around the world. And we could power the whole place right now if we just decided to do it with wind, solar energy, some tidal energy, some geothermal energy. We could run the whole place. It entirely depends on how much energy you would need. At this moment, we use roughly 600 cordillion BTU of primary energy which is the same as 170,000 terawatt hours. We cannot electrify everything yet. Let's see what the Renewable Energy Policy Network, REN21, has to say about this in their 2016 Renewable Energy Report. According to this report, solar and wind are the biggest with about 665 gigawatts of installed capacity at the end of 2015. How many terawatt hours would we get from that? 1150 terawatt hours from wind, 406 terawatt hours from solar. That's about 1500 terawatt hours from wind and solar. We need 175,000 terawatt hours. It also shows that over the year 2015, the world added about 115 gigawatts of wind and solar over the entire world. This equals about 260 terawatt hours per year. So if we want to jump from 1500 terawatt hours to 175,000 terawatt hours, it would take us 670 years to get there. So this seems like an enormous leap of faith. Despite all the heavy investments, nothing suggests that we can actually do this as quickly as Mark C. Jacobson suggests. I've also forgotten to tell you that our energy demand is going to explode within 20 years from 600 quads to 800 quads, or an increase of about 65,000 terawatt hours. 
we both know where this growth will be coming from. The hungry and thirsty people in Africa, South America, the Middle East and Asia. Not to mention the growing trouble we will have with sustainably growing crops and providing potable water without depleting our aquifers. Wouldn't shut down existing nuclear plants. This is not what your dear friend Mark C. Jacobson is proposing. In fact, he foresees the elimination of the entire nuclear industry, including the parts that might be able to provide you with the much needed isotopes for space exploration. Need RTGs running on plutonium? Tough luck. Jacobson wants it all gone. Need nuclear medicine? Gone. Are you sure you've read the scientific literature behind the solutions project? But it's really hard to build a new nuclear plant because nobody wants them around. This is a non sequitur. Not only is it not true that people don't want to build them anymore, this may be the case for certain Western countries, but most developing countries will build them regardless, whether we want it or not. Besides, the math is against any argument against nuclear. It is clear that we are in dire need of all low-carbon energy sources. My question to you, Bill. Do you want to defeat climate change as quickly as possible? And the corollary question would be this. Would you agree that we have to throw everything at this problem, regardless of some of the hurdles we must take to get it done? I will explain in a minute why it is unwise to discount nuclear power and why nuclear power will become far more effective in fighting climate change than it currently is. I think that it is high time that you start to acknowledge this. And if you don't, I'm going to expose doubt concerning your intellectual integrity. Is this thing, uh, you know this word we love, cognitive dissonance, yeah. this phrase. So you have a worldview that disagrees with what you observe. Mm -hmm. So you might expect, if you were uh, open-minded as a scientist, as a scientifically literate voter or taxpayer or kid, you might expect that you'd respect the data and change your mind. The data is pretty clear, albeit with a broad margin of error. There are certain things we simply cannot extrapolate at this moment. How will energy demand grow in the developing countries, for instance? How effective will we be in the total electrification of all our processes? What about material constraints? Jacobson, for instance, is overly optimistic. Just because the elements are present on the earth doesn't mean that we can mine them and do so with the speed required to do this massive renewable built-out bonanza. Have you ever considered the fact that if we want to increase production of wind turbines and solar panels by a factor of 10, that resource requirements will increase manifold as well? Have you ever seen an analysis of copper production rates and tried to corroborate them to copper used in wind and solar technologies? Or what about cobalt? Lithium, phosphor, boron. If I were you, I would be far more hesitant to promote the solutions project because these resource limitations have not been weighed correctly. But you see what I'm saying? Right, is yeah. that, so our problem, everybody, is this doubling down, this backfire effect. And so we have to work, I think, diligently in the science community to fight back. Of course, there are the facts. Yeah, we'll start with those, but there's this human nature thing on both sides to fight back. We have our bubble over here, they have their bubble over there. The Planetary Society's Board of Directors and I would like to offer five recommendations for the United States Space Program during your tenure. Number one, keep the planet Mars as the goal for human space exploration. We strongly recommend against starting over. Let's maintain all of the existing programs, robotic missions. Extraterrestrial robotic missions have the highest chance of success when they are fitted with RTGs. 
RTG stands for Radioisotope Thermoelectric Generator and is being fueled with plutonium-238. That's a nuclear fuel, which helps generate electricity thanks to decay heat and will run for decades, keeping alive Voyager, Cassini and Curiosity rover. This is the same way we explored the moon. Apollo 8 orbited the moon before Apollo 11 landed there. Right, and what did the astronauts use on the moon to get their electricity? RTGs. Number three, strengthen NASA science. NASA has four science divisions that explore the deep cosmos, our solar system, the sun, and our home planet Earth. NASA engineers and technicians build and launch robotic spacecraft that support tens of thousands of American jobs in engineering, precision manufacturing, and science. I urge you to embrace the full potential of all of NASA's science programs so they can continue to lead the world in science, technology, and exploration. I share your optimism about the ability of NASA to create a great future for the world. Thousands of gifted people from all over the planet will be able to deploy their talents there and come up with amazing stuff. Private space companies have grown substantially in the past decade. Let's unleash private investment in low Earth orbit and find ways to encourage this next generation of entrepreneurs and inventors to blaze a trail to Mars and beyond. There's a new movement for space happening today. Let's keep it going. Small modular reactors and molten salt reactors. The ambitions and capabilities of private nuclear startups have grown substantially in the past decade. Let's unleash private investment in energy abundance and find ways to encourage this next generation of entrepreneurs and inventors to blaze a trail to a prosperous future for all. There's a new movement for energy happening today. Let's keep it going. Did you see what I did there? Not only must we keep our current fleet of reactors running, we must encourage startups to build their designs, test them and commercialize them. Otherwise, this entire well, there are only designs narrative will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. By the same token, if we would say that about any of the things we do in space, often with decades of planning ahead, none of it would ever happen. You, Bill Nye, as the head of the Planetary Society, surely must know that. Small modular reactors, and the molten salt reactor in particular, are right around the corner. These are natural iterations of extant technology. We already had a functioning molten salt reactor back in the 60s. You, as an ex-airplane engineer, must know how complex airplanes are, especially the Boeing 747 on which you worked. And yet we built one, maybe two a day. Molten salt reactors are simpler. We can build these like we built airplanes or buses or ships. We can churn out hundreds of these units each year. But this will only happen if people like you start supporting these creates idea too. The skepticism you show when new nuclear designs are concerned is just as unwarranted as the skepticism others show about space exploration. We achieve the stuff we set out to do. Another thing about the molten salt reactor is that it is inherently safe. It cannot blow up because it runs at atmospheric pressure. The fuel is already molten, so a meltdown cannot happen. If there is a failure, the fuel will simply drain into a subcritical drain tank and solidify. Yes, that's right, the fuel cools down because it wants to cool down. It's the polar opposite of the extant light water reactors, where you need pumps to keep the fuel rods from overheating. So there it is. I submit to you, Bill Nye, that you should be optimistic about renewables, but that you should also stay true to space exploration technology and molten salt reactor startups. 
For those two branches of science will help humanity flourish. We will be ending wars over fossil fuels. We will be ending deaths from diarrhea, malaria and malnutrition. And we will usher in an age of space exploration thanks to the renewed prosperity on Earth and our increased harmonious coexistence with the biosphere. If you like this video, please click the thumbs up button and subscribe because it really helps the channel out. Also, if you want me to create more of these videos, please check out my Patreon page and pledge a little amount of money so I can take care of my family while creating more content. Value for value. Thank you for watching.